Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is John F. Pfaff, professor of law at Fordham Law School and author of Locked In, The True Causes of Mass Incarceration and How to Achieve Real Reform. Welcome to Free Thoughts, John. Thanks so much. It's discussed a fair amount. I think it's quite widely known. I, I, it's, I don't, my bubble is pretty bubbly, though, because maybe people don't understand how many Americans are in prison. But how bad is it? So in any given day, there are about 1.5 million people in prison and about another 750,000 people in jail, either awaiting trial or, or detained for a misdemeanor. What's the just... What's the difference between prison and jail? So pr prison is where you go if you be convicted of a felony, which is a crime that carries a sentence of at least one year. Jail is used either for misdemeanors, where the sentence can't be more than a year, uh, or for pretrial detention, people who don't make bail. There's variations across states, but that's roughly how the rule goes. Are they different sorts of institutions? Like, is it different inside a jail than it is a prison? It is. Uh, partly the, the turnover in jails is much greater. So in any given day, there are about 750,000 people in jail, but about 10 to 12 million pass through every given year, um, which is a staggering number we, we tend not to focus on. For prisons, there's about 1.5 million people in and about 2 million people pass through each year. So there's not that much the same level of turnover. Uh, they're also run by different bureaucracies. Jails are run and paid for by the county, and prisons are run and paid for by the state. Uh, which has important incentive implications, but also I think prisons tend to be better funded, uh, oftentimes uh, better maintained, just because they're coming from a, a much bigger budgetary uh, source. And how does that number compare to the rest of the world? There's, in terms of incarceration rates, there's, there's really no one close. Technically speaking, the United States has the second highest incarceration rate in the world right now. Uh, the Seychelles, with a population, country population of 99,000, a jail pop, prison population of about 600, uh, is currently ahead of us by, by about 50 people. If they let 50 go, they would drop back to second. Um, <laughs> but outside of that one exception, we are, you know, we have an incarceration rate, if you combine prison and jails, of about around 700 per 100,000. Uh, places like France and Germany are at around 100 per 100,000. England's at 200. Uh, and they're the highest in, in Western Europe. Uh, the only countries in the world that are close to us are places like Russia, Cuba, Kazakhstan. Right? Not, not exactly countries we, we tend to compare ourselves to. But is it fair to make those comparisons when something like North Korea might not be using prisons per se in convicting of crimes, but actually mass work camps? And so the maybe whole country is a prison. The whole country is a prison. So there's, there are 100,000 per 100,000 incarceration rates. So, so my response to that is that if your defense is, but what about North Korea? I think I've won the argument. Good, good right? point. <laughs> that, that's probably generally true. Well, well, so crime in America is pretty high. Um, it seems that that would be a re it's, it's higher than Western Europe. To be fair, outside of lethal violence, we're about middle of the pack compared to Europe. We're not really have that much of a higher crime rate than Europe. We, for lethal violence, we are exceptionally higher, um, although lower, I think, than Americans think. Um, but I think that the right crime comparison to make to keep it within our country is that our crime rate today is about where it was in 1970, but our incarceration rate is five times higher. So unless you think Americans are sort of five times more prone to violence today than they were in 1970, that seems hard to justify. Uh, if anything, I'd argue we're less violent today, independent of prisons, than, than we were back then. Um, it's harder to commit crimes. It's hard to steal a car now. It's hard to steal a car radio. Um, it's, we have better medical care, so murders become aggravated assaults because people live longer. Um, people play Xboxes, and so they're not out doing stupid things with their friends. Um, also, I think it's worth noting that you know, the boomers were a uniquely violent cohort. Um, one of the many things that they just screwed everything up in America about. It's been a long running theme of this show. It, it has been. What's yes. wrong with the boomers? I, I'm glad I can add my part because when it comes to crime, they've been particularly bad. Uh, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that the, the much maligned millennials – they were equally large of a cohort in terms of total number as the boomers. And they hit their sort of peak crime offending years when crime was at sort of its lowest, right? So the millennials aged into and are now aging out of crime during a period when crime fell. So it seems like as a cohort, the millennials are just less violent. It's patho pathological laziness. It's hard to Snapchat a crime. I mean, I guess yeah. sexting would be maybe a, the new crime for millennials, but it's not a crime wave. But, but I mean, we're talking about all these statistics, but one of the things that you do a good job of pointing out in the book is that there's just a ton we don't know also. What, what kind of things don't we really know? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things you as a right. researcher would love to have better data on. But. So here's some of the amazing things we just don't know. How many Americans have a criminal record? 
No idea. We have survey data that gives us estimates, but we don't really know. Uh, but it could be as many as 60 or 70 million people have a criminal record. Uh, in fact, some people are going to hypothesize that one reason why labor force recovery in the United States is incomparable to that in Europe is there's literally 60 million people who are struggling to find a job that Europe just doesn't have a similar kind of, they don't have the similar records or the similar treatment of those who have, have records. Um, I can't tell you how many unique people have been to prison. I can tell how many we admit every year. I can tell how many leave every year. But how many of those are people cycling through? How many of them are unique people? Very hard to say how many people have, have had that experience. We have no data on what prosecutors do. N nothing. We don't know how they choose their cases, why they do what they do. We barely even understand what their offices look like on, on the inside. Um, and as I point out in my book, they are the single most powerful actor in the system, and we have just no data on them whatsoever. Why would those numbers be – I mean, why wouldn't we have that data? Like, so the – how many unique people – are in prison um, or or have been in prison seems like I mean the prisons have records. There's records at the court level. So why can't we get that data? So it exists, but oftentimes it exists at sort of the state or county level. And so gathering that's very expensive. Compiling it together is very expensive. I figure out how to make it comparable is expensive. I mean, one thing I find really remarkable is the FBI gathers crime data, and the Bureau of Justice Statistics gathers data on sort of everything else, and you actually can't merge their data together. They use different codes for crimes in ways that don't overlap well. And so you can't really just slide. So even, even the two big federal bureaucracies, you can't slide together. So imagine trying to combine New York data with California data. You can do it, and, and they're working on it. Um, but it gets even trickier. So there is, a, there is a prison data set that allows you to watch a person enter prison in New York. You can watch that same person leave. You can watch them enter again, right? Exactly what you'd want to be able to see. But you can't do that then with New Jersey also, right? So you commit a crime in New York one week. Uh, two years later, you commit a crime in New Jersey, and then you commit a crime in New York again. And the data he'll show up as two different people because they have two different ID numbers. Like you can try to match names, but there's typos in the records, and they don't keep the same kind of records. And it's just really hard. Um, and we're slowly trying to do it, um, but we just underfund our data agencies to such a staggering degree. I mean, the BGS, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, they do amazing work. And yet to try to balance the federal budget, they keep shaving their budget down by like $5 million at a time, right? You're not going to save anything worth $5 million, but for like a $50 million agency, that $5 million cut is huge. And so they just don't have the resources to, to do what we need to do to figure out how to really understand how the system works. So if we have roughly the same crime rate as we did in 1970, um, and but we've got five times you said as many people in prison as we did then. Yeah, five uh, times the rate. What are those extra people in prison for? Or I guess how much of that? Okay, so the rate. So the population is already controlled for in right, there. Right. Exactly. Okay, so what are those extra people in there for? So here's what makes reform very tough. And I think there's room for reform, but you'll you'll immediately see why the politics is gonna be very hard. There are almost as many people in prison today for murder as the entire prison population in 1970. Right. There are about 300,000 people in prison total in 1970. There are about 250,000 people in prison for murder. Right. A lot of the people in prison, over half of all people in prison are there for violent crimes. That's not to say that that works from a deterrence point of view or that we're incapacitating effectively, but to really push back, we're going to have to start asking really hard questions about the way we punish people convicted of, of violence. But you make a very uh, big point. I mean, it's a, a part of your book is to explain what is not causing this problem. And I go to a lot of criminal justice reform meetings and I am part of the kind of community of people trying to fix this. And there's a few things that you always hear and, and you point them out in your book. You actually just call it an all ca – not in capitalized standard story, uh, the, the things that everyone thinks is causing this. So the first one is the drug war. Right. And you say no. So at a simple level, it's no because as it stands today, while Americans believe about half of all people in prison are there for drugs, the actual number is 16 percent. Uh, so less than one in five people are there for, for drugs. Almost everyone is there for a property or, like I said, over half are there for a violent crime. But half of all federal prisoners about are drugs. That's true. But the feds are about 10 percent of all prisoners, right? So the feds are 10 percent. The states are 90 percent. Uh, and this, the states all kind of look more or less like each other and no one looks like the feds, right? So the states are all kind of in that 16 to 20 percent and the feds are uniquely in that 50 percent because the feds just have very – they have very strange jurisdictional rules, right? When I was a federal clerk in a federal court, if the judge and I were walking home and we got mugged together, his offense is a federal crime. Mine would have been a local D.C. crime, right? I, I wasn't a sufficiently high-ranking enough federal employee, right? You want to get a federal arson charge, you literally need to, like, burn down the White House, right? That, that, that's what it takes. Um, so the states are just – they just look different, um, and they're about 16 percent. That's still all told about 200 and some thousand people, right? Letting those people out would, would be a – Significant drop, and and you no, know, there's it's not clear they should be in prison. Um, but then it, 
it gets a little more complicated, right? So the immediate rebuttal I always hear is, oh, but that's that's too narrow in accounting, right? What about the guy who's in prison for theft because he stole the fetus drug habit, right? What about the person who's in prison for murder because they killed someone in a drug deal? Those are property and violent, not drug crimes. And in our official taxonomy, drugs are towards the bottom, um, but they're still caused by the, by the drug war. Fair point, but not exactly. So to start, everyone who's in, almost everyone in prison for drugs is there for trafficking. Now, to be fair, trafficking selling to be a fairly small amount of drugs. You know, even does that just mean that they're over a weight limit? Right. Yeah. And in some states, that weight limit is fairly small. Um, but in the end, when you when you dig into sort of what little data we have that really digs into like the backstory, not just the official record, but asking inmates like, what did you actually do? Most people in prison, they're not kingpins. They're not moving like giant tractor trailers of heroin. But it's not like you know the small amount in general. So if we legalize drugs. And so you can start being able to buy your drugs at the corner drug dispensary. Those drug dealing jobs are going to go away. But the people who are in prison for trafficking aren't going to suddenly get legal jobs, right? Those jobs don't exist. They're selling drugs not because they want to sell drugs. They're selling drugs because they're systematically cut off from the primary labor market. They're undereducated. They lack the social connections to get the jobs. They're sort of you know, racially excluded from the jobs. And so if the drug market goes away, the people who are there for trafficking are going to have to turn to something else illegal to get by, right? So the drug offenses will go down, but the property offenses will go up. And we're actually seeing this in New York, where the New York Times had an article recently saying that street gangs in New York City are starting to shift away from drugs and towards identity theft, right? Because the drug market economics are changing and they're trying to find that next new thing. And that next new thing is not, you know, coding at Google. They don't have that access to the education or, or, or you know, the training to do that. They're trying to other, ironically, sophisticated, you know, illegal activities. It seems that something but like fighting the drug war causes a bunch of things that might have like corollary effects that are not wouldn't be captured in the statistics for example higher police presence in uh, urban neighborhoods who are mostly looking for drug crime but in the course of looking for it have more interactions with the police and and, and put more people in prison for other things so we see harassment of minority neighborhoods and everyone's not going in there for for drugs necessarily but you could see you could catch them doing something so that could cause also more incarceration it's true although the catch is that the drug markets and one of the things that complicates the whole prohibition causes violence argument is that there's a lot there's evidence increasingly that a lot of it is that the drugs came to where the violence already was. Right? There's evidence that it, sort of worldwide, history-wide, if you take a bunch of young men and deny them upward mobility, and then the state doesn't really enforce the laws against murder, they will turn to violence amongst themselves for one reason or the other. This is a, a point that Julie Ovi makes in her fantastic book, Ghetto Side. And so she, takes, she looks at LA. That's where she was a journalist. And she points out that, you know, look at South Central LA. Young black men with no upward mobility, you know, sort of systematically cut off from the job market, and the clearance rate for murder, the rate at which the police arrest people who for murder, the overall clearance rate for LA County is sixty percent. So, about shockingly, one third of all murders produce no arrest at all. Um, it, that's kind but, of amazing because a lot of murders are pretty easy to solve. Right. And so, once you take out the easy to solve, the actual clearance rate for complicated murders is vanishingly small. But for black men, the clearance rate is thirty percent. Right? So wow. Two thirds of all black male murders do not result in an arrest. So the state is not enforcing its rules against violence. And there's no upward mobility, and so they turn to violence. And you know, that's in, in that environment, drugs will come. There's no, there aren't other things they can do, right? And so, it, drug selling becomes appealing. Um, so, if you were to legalize drugs, but not solve these underlying structural problems, it's not clear the murder rate would drop that much. Don't oversell that. There was a clear spike in murders from '84 to '91, tied to crack and the instability that market created. I don't want to say it's all just you know structural and drugs plays no role, um, but it's easily overstated. And, and that was true of prohibition too. That the the the, the ledger of murder rise of, during prohibition isn't quite as clear cut as we like to think it is. Is that clearance rate uh, that thirty percent clearance rate right. for murders of black males? So you say it's the the police not enforcing. The murder laws, right. but could it be? So you, we mentioned that if you there's the easy to solve murders and then right. there's the difficult to solve murders, and there's the the wonderful essay, the simple art of murder by Raymond Chandler, um, where he's lambasting the the British cozy murder mystery writers like Agatha Christie because he's like those kinds of murders where it's you know some elaborate thing are really easy to solve. You but mean the hardest, you call everyone to dinner. You call everyone to dinner and you poison some <laughs> teacups <laughs> exactly, or something. Yes. Right. Um, but that the the hard to solve murders um, and the real murders are. The random the guy getting shot in the alley at right. night when it's raining, and so could that low clearance rate be that if if this is drug related violence, it's gang related violence, that simply the kinds of murders that occur in that community look more like the hard to solve ones than the easy to solve ones. I mean, that's part of it, uh, but there's also a certain sort of circularity here, right? That 
because the people don't trust the police, because the police oftentimes don't do a good job, they're less willing to come forward and talk, right? Because if you don't get the guy and you're the one who talked, now you've exposed yourself to risk, right? So part of it is that, yes, these are hard to solve murders, but they're also harder to solve because the people don't trust the police because the police aren't f- trying to solve them as aggressively as they could in the first place. Um, and part of Leovi's book is sort of looking, though, she's, a, she's an LA Times journalist. She's sort of embedded with these homicide de- the bureaus. And her point is that there are some cops who really work hard, and they do get their person for these tough cases. They will just go back to the house 10 times and, and get it. But lots of times they sort of close them out some more administrative way because um, it's just not worth – they don't see it as being worth the effort. You've discussed like, New York and LA and different jurisdictions, which, which reminds me of a of a great, just observation you make early in the book, and you continually come back to in different ways. And one way you describe it is that there are three thousand one hundred and forty four stories of prison growth, of incarceration growth. Uh, why 3,144 stories? Right. So because there are 3,144 counties, um, although technically speaking, some states aggregate their offices up. So it's probably about 2,500 DA offices nationwide. Um, but the idea here is that we tend to think about prisoners as these prisons as sort of these state institutions. There's the New York State prison. There's the Tennessee prison. There's Florida's prisons. But no one just goes to prison, right? Someone has to decide to file the charge and seek out the, the either the conviction or the plea bargain, and that person's a prosecutor. And they vary by county. And there's huge variation within a state across counties in terms of sort of how they behave. Uh, so again, sort of looking at my home state of New York, New York has the longest sustained decarceration in the United States right now. Uh, we started shrinking in 1999. Uh, since then, we've shed about 25,000 prisoners from about 80,000 to around 55,000. It's one of the bigger success stories that we've seen. What's interesting is that New York State didn't really decarcerate. New York City did. Most other counties actually have more people in prison now than in 1999. New York City doesn't. And we're such a big enough portion of the state that we drove things down. Um, But in most states that show decarceration, if you actually look at county by county, some go up, some go down. It's generally urban counties that are going down and rural counties that are are going up. Um, But it very much is this local DA who we rarely talk about who has tremendous power. Uh, who really determines who goes to prison and who doesn't. Which is also part of this problem of understanding that it's most prisoners aren't federal uh, and then th- all the different policies in all these different states. We have Louisiana, who's I think the highest incarceration rate in the country. Yes. In the highest incarcerating country. Exactly. And then I think maybe Maine is the lowest or somewhere in the northeast. Uh, it's one of those one states of, up there. One of those. Yeah. Uh, so it's all very different. So it's solving the problem it's not just a problem. It's no. many different problems together. But and, one thing you mentioned is is longer prison sentences too, that right. some, of, some of these local jurisdictions, some people say that longer prison sentences are what are is part causing of the standard this. Story. Right. Yes, like three strikes obviously is the biggest example. Right. And, and, and you that say gets, that's not necessarily it's true. It's not true. And that oftentimes gets back to how varied the story is, right? That we are 50 states and 3,000 counties and every state has its own different set of pathologies, right? So, you read these these articles that about this giant increase in people serving life sentences, and it's happened. But over a, a quarter of those sentences are just in California. Right? So California imposes a lot of life life with parole option parole sentences. Most other states don't, uh, and like something like ninety percent of all three strike sentences nationwide have been handed down in California. And you know, juveniles getting LWOP, right, life without parole, right. Something like you know, half of all juveniles who got life without parole have been lived in like ten counties, right. So each county has its own defects. They're they're very very spread. But the fact is is that yes, our sentences are longer than European sentences, and if they were shorter, we'd have fewer people in prison. But to explain the growth in prison, it's not really clear sentences have gotten any longer, um, and they're surprisingly shorter than what people think. I recently asked a bunch of undergrads um, at, at a really good liberal arts college, how long do you think like the median time spent in prison or someone convicted of violence is? Um, like a, assault, you mean? Yeah, like a, aggravated assault, robbery. Say maybe two and a half years. So you came in under. It's actually four. Um, but they were guessing 30, 40, like oh, 20, wow. 30 years. Yeah. They thought well, they, I, I do work in the right. area. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I think if you ask people how long are they in prison, oh, everyone's in prison for 20, 30 years, and especially for drugs, right? Those are even longer because that's what you hear about. You hear about the Weldon Angelos is getting life without parole for their first time offense. But for property and drugs, it's one year, and for violence, it's four. And those haven't really changed all that much over the past 20 or 30 years, right? So again, if violence was two, not four, we'd have probably 25% fewer people in prison. It, it, it's not trivial. Um, but but it's much more being driven by admissions than by length of time. We were just admitting a lot more people today than we did 30 or 40 years ago. How much of this is different? So difference between states um, is difference in 
the specifics of the criminal law in that state versus, I guess, prosecutorial discretion or culture? I think it's more discretion or culture that, you know, there are variations in law, but what prosecutors spend their time doing at the state level is almost entirely the stuff that every state agrees to be punished. It's all murder, aggravated assault, rape, larceny, theft. You know, sort of the the, the over-criminalization story that we're sending people to prison for, you know, you know, it's a federal crime for your to not clean up your dog if he poops in the national park in Minnesota, right? None of that really exists at the state level. There are the occasional cases, but they, they they almost never get prosecuted. It's mostly, you know, everyone agrees murder is a crime. They might differ about how much to punish it or how much to punish aggravated assault, but I think it's primarily driven by by DA cultures, and not even across states. I think across counties. I think, you know, the DAs of New York City probably have more in common with the DAs of like Austin, Texas, than they do with the DAs in like you know upstate New York. Should this trouble us? Because I mean, so if there's if there's any area that's kind of core role of government, it's protecting us and from these kinds of crimes um, and punishing the perpetrators of these kinds of crimes. That there's that much discretion, you know, that we have we've taken this like the the primary role of the state and turned it over to what amounts to culture or whim of a handful of people. People that we knew in law school that I necessarily <laughs> yeah. would not trust uh, yes. deciding uh, these things. Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's interesting actually. I find my students who want to be DAs are sort of the ones as they graduate, I almost would trust the most. They tend to serve amongst my best students. Um, but I worry about what office culture will do when, when they get there. Um, I think you're right. I, but it's, I think it's a little trickier than that. I think it's a combination of discretion with little oversight and an incredibly skewed form of political control, right? So there, I think there are two big problems with prosecutors. One is we have almost no metrics on what they do, right? Maybe they do a sort of, you know, convictions per arrest, is sort of the number they might campaign on. Um, we don't really have any good insight about sort of what they're doing, why they're doing it, what drives it. So we're kind, of, we're kind of voting based on sort of those one or two shocking cases. So that's, that's one big problem. If we, if we really understood in detail what they're doing and paid attention, maybe discretion wouldn't be so bad. The other problem is that we elect DAs at the county level. It seems like this boring bureaucratic issue, but I think it has huge implications for how they behave because they're elected by the county, but they tend to operate, at least in urban counties, they tend to operate in the city. Um, but the suburban voters tend to have disproportionate power. So you get this disconnect between cost and benefit. The prosecutors responding to the suburbs, enforcing law in the city. The suburbanites feel the benefits of reduced crime. Their commute feels safer. They feel happier getting things at lunch when they go in to see a show on Friday night. They don't feel scared. But it's not their brother, not their uncle, not their son, not their nephew who's going to prison unnecessarily, being charged unnecessarily, being hassled unnecessarily. And so it encourages the DAs and to a lesser extent the police who I think respond to the gentrified parts of the city uh, rather than the, the more crime, the higher crime parts of the city. It incentivizes them to focus much more on sort of reducing crime and ignoring the costs of that enforcement. Um, and certainly when it comes to urban-suburban splits, that's where race begins to play an incredibly toxic role. So you have these white, wealthier suburbs who choose the prosecutor who then gets to enforce law in sort of poor, more minority parts of the city. And I think that racial gap creates an even broader empathy gap um, that 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 leads to to some really serious problems. Yeah, that uh, fits with this. There's this, been this broader narrative recently that, that seems to dovetail with nicely, which is you know, so the, the recent elections in France and the results of, of that, that those – those areas of the country where there were actually terrorist attacks overwhelmingly voted against the nationalist person who wanted to shut down immigration. Um, and you get similar stuff in the US and you also on those same lines like the the areas of the country that are most friendly to immigrants are those spots that actually have a lot of immigrants right. and it's like the white rural areas that haven't spent a lot of time around them. Um, and so this this power of like enabling people who have no experience with something and are therefore acutely and sometimes irrationally terrified of it to control how it's going to be enforced against others seems like a problem. Right. I think that's exactly right. And I think it's one reason why federal law in particular is so psychotic, right? You don't see 80 years for drugs in the state system. So those laws just don't exist unless you're literally bringing in like, you know, a container ship full of, you know, cocaine, maybe. But otherwise, you know, you don't get these. You, Weldon Angeles cannot happen in the state system by and large. Um, and I think it's because nowhere is the person with no contact with criminal justice more overrepresented than the U.S. Senate, right? I mean, in, in, in Albany, half of all assembly people in our lower house come from New York City, right? So the legislators already tilted towards those areas where crime tends to be, right? But in, the, in Congress, you have, you know, Wyoming has just as many senators as New York State does, right? And so half the population, which has half the crime, is all in 10 states. That's 20 senators. 
The other half of crime has 80 senators. Um, and I think they, they are this exact problem. For them, it's a symbolic thing that they don't really have any connection to the cost of it. And so they pass these insanely harsh laws because they don't really ever have any contact with those who have really been impacted by them. Another thing that you uh, address head on, which, which I get asked about a lot when I go speak and just in hanging out with people, is private prisons. This is seen to be taken up kind of just part of the anti-corporate almost anti-citizens united, you know, corporate power thing. But it was it's been discussed a lot that and it does seem pretty monstrous to have people making money off of incarcerating people. And so it's, you can sell that. Uh, do pri private prisons and their lobbying efforts, have they contributed a bunch to the incarceration rate? So here's the thing. The total number of people in, state, in private prisons is 8 percent, 92 percent in state facilities, 8 percent in private facilities. There's no evidence that states that have private prisons saw any greater growth in states that did not have private prisons. I think I said that right, right? There's no difference between the states, whether you have them or you don't have them. Um, and so there's really no indication they really matter all that much. And, and you're right. It's kind of disgusting to think about people profiting off of locking some up in a cage. But here's the catch. Private prisons made $400 million in profits the other year, the two major groups. It, it was CCA. Now it's something else. It's now. called something else. I they they just changed now. it last like a month ago. And, and Geo Group. We spend fifty billion dollars a year on corrections. Half of that is wages. So while the private prisons made four hundred million dollars, the correctional unions made two hundred made twenty five billion dollars. Right. That's profiting off of people being in prison. And, and, you know, and every pathology that exists in private prisons exists in the public sector just at a at a bigger scale. So. Looking back to New York State, people so people complain about private prisons that they have these terms, sort of these minimum capacity terms. You must maintain this prison at at least eighty percent capacity, or if not, you have to pay us as if eighty percent of our beds are full. People call it a low crime tax. It sounds terrible. It is terrible. New York State has dropped twenty five thousand prisoners, and over that time, now spends more on corrections than before. But New York State has no private prisons. But the Correctional Guard Union keeps all these half-empty prisons open, scattered across upstate New York, to keep the jobs and to keep the wages. That is exactly the same as the minimum capacity contract in a private prison. This public prison is half-empty but fully staffed. It is if they're getting paid for having those beds being taken up. Right? So when people say, well, privates do these things, I say, well, publics do the exact same thing. Right? And it's not about profit. It's about incentives. So the classic private prison horror story is this. And it sounds terrible. You pay a prison per prisoner per day. And so the prison cuts back on training, on staffing, on, on everything they can, on food quality, to try to get some sort of margin on each prisoner, right? And then they take those margins and they pull them out of the prison and use for their own private ends. And then they campaign hard to maintain prisoner count then fight reform because every body in their prison is cash. In fact, having bad training and rehabilitation works in their favor because everyone who comes back is more cash, right? I agree, this is horrible. But what I've just described is the entirely public contract system in Louisiana, right? The state facing capacity constraints enter into contracts with local public sheriffs to house state inmates in public jails. And the sheriffs did this exactly what I said. They undercut spending. They took that money to spend on their own department outside the prison. It is the classic private prison horror story. But when it started, it was entirely public. Now, the privates came in later to help them build out the jails as sort of these collateral sort of groups that latched on. But the failure was entirely public, entirely about incentives. And so you could create private prisons with different incentive contracts. Maybe they work better, right? So Australia is actually trying this. They've created a prison in Australia run by Sodexo um, where the payment is tied to recidivism, not to capacity, right? So if these people don't come back, you start getting paid more. Uh, and Pennsylvania just did that with their halfway houses. Uh, they terminated all their contracts. Now they have a, sort of a recidivism incentive compliance term in their contracts. Um, so I think we focus on the wrong things. They're not that big. The public sector unions are far more powerful, get far more money, have all the same problems. And really, it's about incentives, right? And that if we gave privates better incentives, they would act better. And we give publics terrible incentives, they'll act just like the privates. And we'd be focusing more on the inputs about why there are so many people going through the criminal justice system to end up in one of these entities seems seems wise. You mentioned recidivism, which you discuss in the book um, as part of the standard story, parole violations, parole right. issues. Uh, what is the chance that someone ends up back in prison? And then also in the, in the more interesting wrinkle here is why is that question more complicated than it seems? Yeah. So this actually is, the question actually has two answers to it. Um, one is 50% and one is 33%. 
So the way the BGS counts things is you look at a cohort that leaves prison in one year. Then you ask, what's the chance over the next five years someone ends up back in prison? And it's about one half. And that's a useful number. A half of all those leaving end up back in prison. But I think when someone asks you, what's the chance of going back to prison? The question they're asking isn't, what is the chance that someone released from prison in 2010 goes back to prison? Right? They're trying to ask, if you've ever been admitted to prison, what's the chance you're going to go back? And that's about one third. And that, what that gap is reflects the fact there are certain people who cycle through several times. Right? So out of any given cohort, Half are, half are going to go back. But in some of those cohorts, it's the same guy going back. And so if you take those guys out and don't double count them, if you've ever been to prison, there's about a one-third chance you'll end up back in prison, um, not, not one half. Um, that said, most of those people who cycle through only go through twice, at least over a 14-year period, uh, which is the data range that we have. Right? So this idea that these people just like, revolve around over and over and over again, that doesn't really seem to be true. Most people go once. Um, most who go back are only going to go back twice, at least in a, in a 14-year period. So then is there any truth to this, the conception that by sending people to prison for, say, smaller level crimes, we're, we're training them to become more criminal than they would have been otherwise because they're spending four years, call it, in, in an environment with a whole bunch of other people who are criminal? No, there's definitely truth to that. Uh, in fact, there's a, a really fascinating recent paper that managed to show uh, that actually the longer you send someone to prison, the more likely they are to recidivate upon release um, and, 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 and controlled in a very, very clever and very trustworthy method. It's a very tricky question statistically, but he did a really good job addressing that, um, which suggests that you, you get worse the longer you're in prison, right? And so it becomes this arms race. Like you're, you're not committing crimes, so you're out while you're in, but you come out, you commit more. Like what's the trade off going to be? Um, but realize that prison is kind of the rarest way we punish you, right? There are about 1.5 million people in prison, there are about six or seven million people on probation and parole. Um, you know, there's another 700,000, 50 in jail with 12 million cycling through every year, right? So just because, um, and, those, and those are just people we catch, right? The tricky thing about recidivism is, is we view our recidivism data as these are only people who commit another crime. Well, no. These are people who perhaps commit another crime and get caught and we choose to file charges, and we choose to move the case forward, right? So it's, it's a very skewed perception, right? In certain populations are more heavily policed, we're going to pick up more recidivism there. Then other populations are less policed, but might be actually offending at similar rates, right? So it's, it's a very, it's one, of those, it's one of those terms that we think is very objective. Recidivism rate, it's, it's a number, but actually when you dig down, it's a really messy number to, to use. There's, and, and states vary as to what counts as recidivism, right? If I punch someone, I'm going back to prison, right? If I don't have a job, I'm going back to prison. Perhaps if I drink alcohol, which is not a crime if you're not on parole, but might be a crime if you are on parole, right? So exactly what are we counting when we count this? And, and it varies from county to county, parole officer to parole officer. Um, so I think there is, there certainly is a, a crime causing impact to prison, but it might not always show up in terms of another prison admission. It could show up in a probation or jail or, or some other way of, of dealing with it. It seems that if you're in prison for longer, if that was, maybe the crime was more violent, you have further more difficulties outside of prison and you, and you talk a lot about how prison has a lot of costs to – not just – I mean obvious costs to right. the, the person. I mean we want a violent people to be punished and kept away for some period but their lifetime earnings, their ability to get a job, the single parent families, all these issues in terms of these costs and, and that gets to a really fascinating question that you take head on and I really appreciated that you did, which is um, what is the optimal crime rate and why is that an important question to ask? Right. And I, I would start by saying I try – it's very, very hard to do this. In fact, in writing my book, the word kept creeping in every time I do another round of edits, it sneak in. It's to never wor use the word violent person or violent offender. Um, because violence isn't that, – that sort of makes it sound like this is who they are. They are a violent person. But violence is very much a, a phase, not a state, right? People age into and age out of violence. And I think we're becoming more aware of the aging in. I think that the juvenile death penalty cases and juvenile life without parole cases, I mean, it's realized, hey, you know, 14, 15, 16-year-olds, they are, they're changing, right? And unfortunately, they're, they're underdeveloped but they're also getting more violent, right? And so around 14, 15, you start aging into violence. Um, but the part we tend to ignore is that – or pay less attention to is that when you hit 30 or 40, you start aging out of violence, if not sooner. And, and some of it's hormonal, right? You know, violence and testosterone are very highly correlated. So as your testosterone levels drop, um, other hormonal shifts. Uh, some of it is just physiological, right? Like I'm 41. Like I'm just less likely to get in a fight now than I was 20, right? Just because I'm, I'm going to lose, right? I'm, I'm slower. <laughs> things ache more. Like I'm just kind of tired and lazy. It's not really worth it at this point, right? Um, 
Some of it, though, is also social, right? You have a job. So you're not hanging out with your friends doing something dumb. You have a wife or a husband and you have a child and you have a sense like, I just shouldn't do this. Or again, you're, you're with them and not with your friends. And, and prison, it certainly impacts those, right? Prison might not change your hormonal drift, um, but it makes it harder to get a job, makes it harder to get married. And that actually kind of makes it harder to, to, to desist from, from, from crimes. Um, but I think we do systematically undercount the cost of incarceration, right? When we ever do a cost benefit, right? it saves this much in crime and we spend this much in dollars per prisoner. That's the tip of the iceberg, right? So going to prison hurts your lifetime earnings. You, you work fewer hours, you get paid fewer hours, you get paid less per hour that you work. You, most people, lots of people in prison already had a hard time getting primary jobs, but now they really can't. Um, and we do incredibly stupid things to make the problem worse. So until 2008, when New York State fixed this, but still a problem in other states, the single biggest training program in New York State prisons was barber school. And until they passed the law in 2008, one of the things that Barber Licensing Agency did was categorically deny license to anyone with a record. Oh, great. Right? So we trained all these men to be barbers, and as soon as they leave, they can't get a job as a legal barber. I mean, they work illegally, but now they're exposing themselves to you know, some sort of administrative, if not criminal penalty. Um, New York State fixed it, sort of. It, you can't have a blanket rule for certain professions against people with felony records, um, but it exists in lots of other states, it's similar kinds of bans. Um, so we make it even harder beyond what it already is. It's a great vector for tuberculosis and HIV and other STDs. Um, it leads to an increase in drug overdose deaths upon release. Right In prison, drugs are expensive and low quality. You get released, drugs are cheaper and higher quality. Your tolerance is down because you haven't really been treated effectively, and you overdose. Um, but we don't tie that to prisons. It's so someone died, someone though, an ex-con died in an alley, right? That's not prisons, that's just him, right? But it's not, it's prisons. Um, in some, uh, no dating markets really need... 50% male, 50% female to really function well. And in some heavily policed neighborhoods, it's 60% female, 40% male. Uh, and that really throws off family formation, uh, increases the risk of single parenthood, increases, again, the risk of STD transmission because men are kind of in short supply and they can leverage that to like not have safe sex if they don't want to. Um, so there's all, not to mention just the shame and the stigma, uh, there's financial costs of just travel. Right. You know, in New York State, half of our maximum security prisons are at least 200, if not 300 miles away from New York City, uh, even though half of all the people in them come from New York City. Right? So you've got the hotel costs, the, the, the bus costs, the, the time off from job costs, the, the taking your kid out of school costs, uh, collect phone calls can be almost bankrupting to poor people. And we, you take all these costs, they're, they're, they're staggering, and we, and we just don't count them. Um, and so I, that that's the question about the if you have the costs, and then you're wondering about the optimal crime rate. Right. Uh, the question of uh, and that gets to the you're sort of biting the bullet on violent crime as something that you have to address to get fix this prison problem. Right. But also the idea that we we talk about how can we fix mass incarceration without letting crime go up whatsoever. And and because of all these costs of prison, because of this, you say that's probably the wrong way to look at this right. in some way because prison is very harmful in so many different ways. So it might be the optimal crime rate is higher than it is now uh, because of all the costs that we're imposing on society for, for prison. Right. It's possible, right? We, we, we've studied these collateral costs so poorly that we don't really know, right? And and you don't want to trivialize the attitude of those who live in high crime neighborhoods. You know, uh, James Foreman just came out with a book called Locking Up Our Own about how, you know, oftentimes African Americans are amongst those who are toughest on crime because it was their communities that are most devastated by it. And, and they do... There is a very strong law and order view in, in a lot of these high crime neighborhoods for, for very understandable reasons, right? And you, and you don't want to come along and say, oh, no, you people don't worry about crime. There are other things to worry about. What, what I think it pushes me towards is a much greater degree of localism, right? Instead of letting the suburbs sort of in their abstract decide what's best for the city, push that decision making towards the cities. And it could be we'll find that, you know, in certain times of rising crime, this, we might actually end up with a more punitive system that way, right? There's actually a sense during the 60s that we didn't react to rising crime in the 60s that quickly because the white suburbs just didn't care, right? Oh, Detroit's on fire? Not my problem, right? Thought the rest of Wayne County. And then when the race riots happened and sort of the social unrest and civil rights, then Wayne County cared too much about what's going on in Detroit and they, they cracked down the other direction. Um, so it could be that during times of rising crime, if localism might lead to actually more punishment. And, and that, I, I guess to me, that's, that's kind of okay, right? As long as those who feel the costs and the benefits are making the calls, maybe that's the best we can do, right? What bothers me is when those who feel the benefits don't feel the cost and then say, hey, yeah, let's crack down. Well, of course you're going to crack down. You're not, it's not your family that's being torn apart by this. Um, if you're the one who feels that the harm of crime and the harm of punishment, I'm more willing to defer to, to their choices, whichever way it happens to go. What do we say to, I mean, this country seems to have a 
rather punitive culture. Yes. Um, we're, we're in very Old Testament sort of place. Um, and so to the, the person who – the kind of extreme cultural conservative caricature almost that would say like, well, so what? Like, you know, these are these are bad people. They did bad things. They didn't have to do those things. They knew that they were bad. They knew there'd be punishment. And so if you, you know, you, you served your time, but the other stuff are just costs of being a bad person, suck it up. And the rest of us, you know, those aren't those aren't costs that we should factor into the administration of justice. I mean, I guess my response would be several. One is that I think that dramatically overstates the extent to which committing crime is just a purely rational choice, right? There's all these structural and emotional pressures. You know, there's all this evidence showing that people operating under extreme poverty, uh, just that that pre- and there's, we, we all have limited mental capacity, right? And so if you're incredibly struggling really, really hard to just figure out how you're going to make it to tomorrow, your ability to start control your anger goes down, right? For all of us, right? So when I sit here and say, oh, I never would have done that. Yeah, because I, I don't worry about eating tomorrow, right? And so it's very easy for you to sit here and say, I would never choose to get in that fight. What is he thinking? He, he chose that, right? Well, if I was actually really unsure if I was going to have enough to eat or make rent tomorrow or if my kid was going to kick out of school and all these pressures, I'd actually have a shorter temper. Um, and so I think we, we tend to overstate sort of how much is within our control. I'd also state that on the one hand, maybe, all right, fine. Like if that's what you believe, that this is what they deserve, I mean, I can't prove you wrong, right? And in my book, I focus on the, the public safety because that's where you can really make a policy argument. But I, I would push back and say, maybe we should actually care about what the victims think, right? Maybe it's not about you, right? Because you're not the victim you're, or you're like a, you're a you know, second order harm. Like you sort of feel the harm of someone else. But let's ask those who are actually victimized what they think. And the most comprehensive survey of victims I've seen indicates that victims tend to be less punitive than the society as a whole. And they tend to be less punitive because your average victim isn't what you see on Law and Order, right? Like the suburban white lady, right? It's a generally a younger black man, right? Person of color and, and male who understand, like lives in this environment and, and understands very much what is going on and why it's happening. And they, 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 they're they not indifferent, right? But their view of justice, they, they want to see justice done. But their view of justice is something much more along short of the restorative justice framework than as long as just like lock them up forever, right? Because they, 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 it's just a much more sophisticated view. And so, yes, you suburbanite hold that punitive view. But if we actually, the same thing you're saying, let's talk to the victims, like let's let's talk to the victims, right? We generally like to pick out the victims who like want to nail them to the wall, right? Those are the victims who always get attention. Um, and I thought it very telling that in this whole controversy over, you know, um, Arkansas and the death penalty, that A. Sutchinson refused to meet with with family members of victims who didn't want to see executions happen, right? He was more than happy to talk to those who said, yes, execute them. But those who came forward and said, no, this won't make me better, right? This just makes the world worse wouldn't even meet with them, right? And so I think we tend to focus on the victims we want to focus on, but actual victims, when you take a broad survey, they're substantially less punitive than, than sir, our, our laws would, would suggest. I'd like to go back to the prosecutor's uh, yes. uh, angle because that that is this thing that you kind of discovered uh, that no one was discussing. And, and I always have wondered what's – I mean, knowing friends who are prosecutors, n- none of them are sadists or anything, but I, I – I encounter cases and wonder if these prosecutors are just – why do they even charge this guy with this absurd crime? Right. Um, we had this case about a fish, for example, at the Supreme Court yes. uh, uh, wondering how they charged a man with a felony for throwing a fish overboard. Right. Uh, so you identified the prosecutor as, a, as the black box of this whole story and you wrote in the book that when you kind of compared these things all together and you saw this one thing – Making a huge difference in the in the incarceration rate, you just sort of stared at your computer and said, "This is what what is the that main factor that you found?" Right. So I used data from 1994 to 2008, which was imposed on me by the by the way the data were gathered. The the, the place who gave me the data, they changed how they gathered it starting in 94, so I just couldn't go back. But I realized that's actually kind of a useful time frame, right? It, it is basically during this period when crime went down steadily, but prison populations kept going up. And as far as I'm concerned, the causal mechanism there might be a very different story than the causal mechanism that's taking place when crime was going up and prison was going up. So I yeah, think because the first few, uh, 100,000 prisoners, you, you know, who are the really violent ones, you might get safety returns on, but we might have stopped getting safety returns on incarcerating people. So that's, the, that's sort of the conventional take that with crime low and prisons high, we must be locking up increasingly marginal people. And that's probably true to some degree. But we arrest 12 million people a year and we admit about 600,000 people to prison every year. 
And we don't know how DAs choose the cases they choose to go after, right? We like to think they triage based on severity, but I would imagine they also triage based on provability, right? And murder cases are very hard to prove. There's actually a pretty shocking example of this, where a couple years ago, the pri- one of the previous Baltimore state's attorneys, the, the head elected official, managed to convince the head of the homicide unit of the police department that he could not issue an arrest warrant without an ADA signing off on it first. And the number of murder arrests in Baltimore fell by half that year. Not because murders went down, but because the DA's office simply stopped signing arrest warrants. This case looks tough, not sure we can do it, not gonna sign the warrant, right? It would make the cops eat the failed clearance rather than getting the cops to make the arrest have the DA's office have to take the, the tough to prove case, right? And so that to me suggests that you know, DAs are focusing on lots of different things, one of which is certainly public safety and severity, but they're also focusing on sort of provability. And we arrest so many people that even as crime goes down, there's probably still a lot of fairly legitimate cases to go after. You know, 1% of all serious property arrests result in a prison admission. And only about one third of all serious violent crime, reported violent crimes result in a prison admission. Um, so there's a lot of cases out there to, to like, go after even, even today. So what did you see when you looked at right. the so 94 to 2008 data? So I saw is that over this data. period, crime is going down and arrests are going down. So there are fewer people entering the criminal justice system altogether. But the number of cases filed in state, felony cases filed in state court went up dramatically. Once a charge was filed against you, the chance that felony case resulted in a prison admission didn't change, and the amount of time you spent in prison didn't change. So the only thing that changed was what's the chance that this arrest turns into a felony case? And it's entirely in the discretion of the prosecutor. Uh, So for some reason, and we don't really know why, the prosecutor institution became more punitive. Um, and what I, I can't really, I don't think I stressed it that much in the book. I mentioned it, but I've come to think that this might really be the main explanation. I'm not convinced that individual assistant district attorneys are any tougher today than they were 30 years ago. But it's a very interesting hiring pattern that happened. From 1974 to 1990, as crime was going way up, we hired 3,000 more prosecutors, from 17,000 to 20,000. From 1990 to 2008, as crime dropped precipitously, violent crime dropped by 25%, property crime dropped by 25%, arrests are down, everything is going down. We hired 10,000 more prosecutors, from 20,000 to 30,000. And we don't have good measures of how productive DAs are being, but all the various proxies I can think of, like how many like serious arrests per DA, how many total arrests per DA, how many people admitted to prison per DA, there's no evidence that between 1990 and 2000, they became any tougher. Right. We just had more of them, right? and they had to do something. Yeah, it seems like if you're one of these 10,000 extra DAs with less crime, but you have a performance review right. and you have some sort of deliverable, I mean, ideally you'd say, well, you know, I didn't do anything this year, boss, because uh, you know, the, the crime rate crime ought to be down. Measure. So this is, right. a, this is a good thing, right? But why would you even keep them on staff? So they'd be trying to come up with some sort of metric of what they're doing, and that would be charging people with crimes. And we arrest enough that there's plenty of them to do that. And so that was an urban phenomenon. At, on the more rural suburban phenomenon we see, and those offices tend to be, the rural offices tend to be small, about maybe two to three DAs per office. But what happens is between 1970 and 2008, the number of counties with a full-time DA, who, like an elected DA, not some part-timer who sort of has a private practice on the side, the number of counties with full-time goes from 45% to 85%. I mean, that's obviously a rural phenomenon, right? Brooklyn didn't decide in like 1994, hey, I guess it's time to get a full-time DA. Like we've had one for a good 120 years, 130 years. So the urban counties ramp up staffing and the rural counties create professional offices. And I think it's just that change in just structure of more people and more professional people who need to like justify their positions. I think I played a huge role in this change. And, and I think presents, you know, certainly the suburban rural area, a significant barrier to change, right? You can imagine cutting back on funding for, for county DA, for major urban DA offices to try to shrink their staffing and perhaps shrink their impact. Well, that's, uh, there's sort of a one-way ratchet there, right? But deprofessionalizing a DA's office, I think is going to be a much harder thing to go from the full-time to firing that person to creating it to being a part-time, figuring a lot of resistance there. And I think it's telling that the crime, dr- the prison dropped since 2010. So prison rises from 1972 to 2010 without any, without any single year where the total prison population goes down. And then from 2010 to 2015, it's dropped by about 5%. Half of that just the state of California, and then 24 other states have shrunk, 25 states have gone up, but you've seen a drop. Um, But most of that drop is urban counties. Um, Counties of over 250,000 people are seeing a decline. Counties of under 250,000 are still going up and up. And so I think the ones that staffed up 
in the more liberal cities are shrinking, the ones that professionalized in the more conservative rural areas are actually getting tougher than before. Were you able to get any data about about the kind of performance reviews that maybe exist for DAs or it, it seems like it might just flow downhill. So you have DA and you have assistant di- district attorneys and so how the DA, what he expects from them, that might be determined by the DA's political ambitions. Uh, does that seem like possibly a controlling – he wants to be governor. You never say my conviction – I did justice. I didn't put that many people in jail. You always say I saved your communities. I put all these people in jail. Elect me governor. So maybe it just flows down to the ADAs from there. It's possible. So from an empirical point of view, the question for prosecutors, do you have data on? I can generally stop you right there. Okay. Right? <laughs> what comes next is irrelevant. The answer is going to be no. Like, no, I just don't have it. Um, but the political ambition theory is certainly one I've been thinking about about. Um, and maybe that explains things that goes on in rural areas more, right? Um, because it's, it's less clear to me. I, I remain unclear and genuinely unclear um, how important the person at the top is for bigger offices, right? Because it's got to flow through all these levels of bureaucracy. Uh, and I think one thing, that, one way to think about it, I think it's very striking is that um, in 2016, at the same time that you had Donald Trump winning election based on sort of American carnage, um, you at the same time saw a lot of cities elect reform-oriented prosecutors and vote out tough on crime prosecutors. Uh, one of them is Kim Ogg in Houston. And the first thing she did the day after her election, she announced that upon being a, upon like actually being put into office, that day she's going to fire the top 50 lawyers in the office. She's going to completely decapitate the entire office. And her argument was, look, I have a staff of like 120 lawyers. I alone can't oversee their day-to-day actions. It has to go through these 50 people who run things. And individually, they're all great lawyers, but collectively, they've created this incredibly punitive culture. If I want to change the culture, you've got to chop off the entire management team. Chicago saw a reformer get elected, Kim Fox. She, for, for, for I understand, for reasons, couldn't do that or, or, or didn't or couldn't. I'm not sure. I'm not really sure which. But so the old staff that was very punitive under her predecessor remains in place. And I'd be very interested to see, like, how do, do things differ in Chicago and Houston in part based on, you know, how, however, well, however great the DA is. If the bureaucracy blow her resists, I think that could be a, a serious challenge. You also point to uh, defense attorneys, and I have friends who are defense attorneys, public defenders, or or otherwise contractual. And in the growth of crimes and charging people, you have a constitutional right to an attorney um, that you could talk to them for twenty five seconds, possibly. Uh, and it's kind of unfair. I mean, it's it's a it's a pretty lopsided game in terms of the prosecutors versus the public defenders, correct? Yeah. So here's here's how terrible the situation is. Uh, to start with, 80 percent of people facing prison or jail time qualify for a state-provided lawyer. Right? So it's a massive responsibility that we have. In pure dollar terms, and these numbers are from 2008, which is the last year we have data, show you how stale our numbers are. I'm, I'm dealing numbers are almost 10 years old at this point. That's our most recent data. We spent about Six billion dollars a year on prosecutors. They spend about four point five billion dollars a year on public defenders. First of all, that's a disparity to start with. Second of all, realize we spend about two hundred billion dollars a year on criminal justice. Right, four point five billion on the lawyers for the defense, two hundred billion overall. Right, so we're already underspending relatively. Um, but then there's this misalignment. But it's worse. There's a study in North Carolina that started from the premise that budget-wise. The DA and the public defender's office got paid the same. They had the same budgets. And that actually annoyed the DAs. The DAs say, we handle 100% of criminal cases. And in North Carolina, the public defenders handled 50% of the defenses. So like the DA said, we're underpaid. But what North Carolina's Office of Indigenous Defense showed is that the police, the, the, the DAs don't pay for investigators. They're called the police and the sheriffs. They don't pay for DNA labs. They don't pay for any of these sort of investigatory services. Public defenders have to pay for all of them. Once you add in all the free services DAs get, their pay their budget is tripled that of the public defenders. Right? So there's this huge misalignment. And then it gets worse from there. The Supreme Court said everyone gets a lawyer. They never said how you had to pay for it, right? Supreme Court only hands down unfunded mandates. Some states pay for it, but in South Dakota, you get charged $90 an hour for your public defender. Nine zero. You're classified as poor. You're getting charged $90 an hour for your public defender. That money is due regardless of the outcome of the case. So if you are acquitted, if you're acquitted because your your public defender finds out that you weren't in that bank that got robbed, you were outside the state, it could not have been you, you still owe $9,000 if it takes them, you know, 10 hours, uh, no, 100 hours to do this case. If you don't pay your public defender, that's a crime, right? Wow. 
Um, but on the on the on the difference in how much money they each have to spend, could we could we explain that away by saying, look, they've got the prosecutors have the much higher burden of proof. They've got the harder job to do. They need more resources because they've got to get beyond a reasonable doubt. Whereas the public defender, you know, kind of gets to to some extent play goalie, play goalie, sit back and wait for them to to get anywhere near that. But that's assuming a trial, right? That's assuming a trial, and you know, ninety five percent of all cases are result in a plea bargain. And one reason they all result in plea bargains is because public defenders don't have time to really go through the case, right? There is uh, Amy Bach wrote this book called Ordinary Justice, and she's not working on actually trying to gather metrics for DAs, but she was a journalist. She went around the country, started looking how the system worked, and she went to this one courtroom in Georgia where this is a, it had a full time DA, a part time public defender. One guy ran the whole public defender's office on a, on a contract that hadn't had his pay increase in like twenty years, ten years, fifteen years, right? And he got it by being the lowest bidder for the job. Um, and he would literally plead out like 30 people in a morning session. They'd, they'd sort of stand up, go down the line, plead them all out. And then Amy, who's been to law school, was talking about like going through his files. And she's like mitigating evidence, mitigating evidence, exculpatory evidence. This could have gotten acquitted. This could have gotten the charges dropped. This could have gotten the charges knocked down. But he's just grinding through these cases so much that he just never had time to really stop and look. And if he wanted an investigator, he had to pay for out of his own budget. Well, no, the, the DA was relying on the, the, you know, the city paid for police departments. Uh, so it's, it's still incredibly skewed. Um, and results in DA public defenders just not having time to you know, go through files and, and really see what's going on. So this is all fairly depressing, and yes. and the fact that you also blow up the problem into three thousand one hundred and forty four different problems, right? And you know we're here in Washington D.C. and very little we could do to fix different counties. But uh, what can we do? And we have very bad political headwinds. You talk about the false positive problem and how how much you have to. How much political, how much political consequences there are to locking up, not locking up a criminal versus right. locking up an innocent man. So the although you have it better to let uh, ten guilty men go free than to lock up one innocent. Like politically, it's exactly the opposite. Right. If you did not lock up a, a, a guilty man and later commits a crime, you're done. Right. So we have all these political headwinds. We have three thousand one hundred forty four jurisdictions. We have prosecutors running amok. Uh, we have laws at different levels. We have behaviors trying to. What can we possibly do? I know you go through a bunch of them, but what do you think are the most promising reform? So, at the same time that we have all these headwinds, at least for prisons at the state level and the county level, prison reform seems to be one of the few genuinely bipartisan issues we have. Right? I mean, I've been at events where you, and this, this is not a euphemism, you'll literally see. The criminal justice, the head of criminal justice for the Koch brothers sitting next to the head of the ACLU's, you know, decarceration project, right? And and it's, you know, a lot of my liberal friends think the Kochs are trying to try, like, sort of smuggle something in to, like, gut the EPA, right? And I'm sure they wouldn't mind getting rid of the EPA, but but their criminal justice focus, it, it's genuine. Like, they are, they are one of the only groups that's actually given money to public defenders, right? Not a lot, not nearly enough to solve the problem, but, like, that's that's not political scheming. That's a genuine interest in trying in trying to fix fix the system. Um, and so I think at the local and state level, there is actually room to move because I think they're really it's, – it's this very fascinating arraignment, right? Arrangement, right? Because you, you have the sort of standard liberal anti-punishment types, right? And there's sort of the, the racial justice sense that this is an incredibly racially biased system that has a, a powerfully disparate impact. They've been campaigning for a long time. On the right, what's come in are sort of these two – we tend to view it mostly as like sort of the Grover Nordquist, we spend too much, let's cut costs group, right? And that's, that's a big part of it. But there's also, I think, an equally powerful sort of Chuck Colson, evangelical Christian second chance side to it also, right? That people are becoming to believe in redemption and, and people, conservatives who have been to prison, like Chuck Colson, came to realize that the, and, and Bernie Carrick, came to realize that like, these people aren't like these irredeemable monsters that we sort of paint them out to be in the press, right? They are no different than you and me and they're no, no less open to the possibility of, you know, turning their lives around. And I think, to me, that's actually the much more durable side of the right on crime, I, I think, than, than the more sort of tax cutting. Because the tax cutting side could easily fold as soon as crime might start going up again, right? Well, then the cost and benefits shift and maybe we should spend this money here. But the, the evangelical side that believes in redemption should be a little bit more, I would hope, resistant to, to just sort of crumbling that that quickly. Um, and so I think there are things we can do. I think, and things we've seen happen. So I think one thing is, you no. Know, guidelines for prosecutors, right? They have unfettered discretion, but they're the only people who have that kind of discretion. Why not impose like, you know, actuarial tools and other guidelines to regulate how they charge, who they charge, how they plead them out? Uh, New Jersey does this for some drug cases. It's not impossible. Um, I mentioned earlier the fact that prisons are paid for by the state. That's a huge problem because you're a prosecutor, you're paid for by the county, right? And so if you send someone to jail or probation, the lesser offenses, that comes out of the county budget, your budget. Send them to prison, 
that comes out of the state budget. So it's safer, it's tougher, and it's cheaper, right? The tougher penalty is actually cheaper for the local officials. And so maybe make them pay for it, right? California's kind of done this with their realignment program, where they've said for certain categories of offenses, even if it's a felony, even if it qualifies for state prison time, you, the county, have to lock them up in your county jail, right? You pay for it. We're not paying for this anymore. In practice, it's a bit more complicated, but that's sort of the underlying logic, right? And and again, California did this. These things can be done. Indiana tried it in a, in a smaller scale with a little bit less success. Um, and so I, I think we, I think for certainly prosecutors, we can adopt guidelines for for focusing on on, on you know the politics of it. I think you know, things like sentencing commissions, right? There are ways we can try to insulate the process from from political headwinds, or or maybe moving things to more local levels. Don't make the DA be elected by Cook County. Chicago elects a DA, and the suburbs elect a DA. Detroit elects a DA, and the rest of Wayne County elects a DA, right? And, and maybe that can break down some of the sort of this sort of I feel all the benefit, but not the cost of being of being tough. But the catch is, is I think it's required thinking big and aiming high, right? Like the, the smaller fixes, they will do good, um, but they're only going to get us so far. And there is a risk lingering there too. There's, there's actually a very fr- sort of depressing, maybe frightening, but probably more depressing poll that Vox did, Vox.com, where they asked people several questions. The first one was, how, what percent of people do you think are in prison for drugs? And everybody said half. Not surprising. But that's solvable. What was kind of scary was the next question, and they broke it out by liberal, moderate, conservative. The question was, are you willing to take someone who's been convicted of violence but poses little risk of violating again? Are you willing to punish that person less? And 55% of liberals to 65% of conservatives said no, right? But those are the cases we're going to have to cut at some point. And I think what's happened is this constant rhetoric of no low-level, nonviolent, low-level, nonviolent. We've convinced the Americans that our prisons are full of low-level, nonviolent offenders, and we can get out of this mess focusing on them. And I will be the first to admit that that's where reform had to start, right? You don't go from 40 years of sustained prison growth and the next day pass the Let's Be Lenient to Murderers Act, right? That, that's not going to happen, right? You start with drugs. That's the obvious place you start. But at some point, you've got to start shifting that, that story. And it's not just like, well, when it's convenient, we'll do it, right? The Americans have come to believe we don't have to have this conversation. They're unwilling to have this conversation. And cracks are starting to, are starting to happen. Um, you know, you, you see this issue of like letting people serve long terms, even for violence, out early is coming up now in, in Louisiana. Right? The toughest state in the country is debating this issue. DAs hate it. They're fear-mongering like crazy. Um, but they're at least talking about it. Um, I came across a, a, an opinion by Richard Posner the other day where out of the blue had nothing to do with what the majority talked about. In his dissent, out of the blue, he said, and also... We need to start talking about the fact that we punish people convicted of violence for far too long, right? And just say, this is the conversation we have to start having. And so you're, I think we're starting to see people say, well, maybe we have to really talk a bit more about, about violence. But it, it's, it's a slow process. And I think some of our sort of constant emphasis on low-level nonviolent does have some, some real costs. Uh, so it's, it's going to be hard. So we're going to have to ask some really hard questions. It's not going to be easy. Um, but I think oftentimes what matters, like the, the, what really matters is the boring stuff, right? And, and maybe sort of if there's time, my favorite example of this. This Please. is dry as dirt, but incredibly powerful is the census. Yes. Right. I, I did have a question about this. So this is, this is a, a fascinating tidbit. If you're in prison, where does the census count you as living? Do you live where you were before you got sent to prison or do you live in the prison? And outside of four states, New York, California, Maryland, and Delaware, you count as living in the prison, not where you came from. So what that does is that you can't vote. You can't vote. You're five fifths of a vote, right? You count as five fifths of a person, but outside of Maine and Vermont, you cannot vote while you're in prison, which, by the way, sets the United States apart from most of the rest of the world as well. And most liberal democracies, even in prison, you can vote. But outside of Maine and Vermont, not here. So that means you could have a county with maybe 700 people in it, but it has a prison. So it has like 3,000 extra people in it, correct? Right, exactly. Who can't vote but count. And now do they not vote and count, but they tend to be disproportionately Hispanic and black from the cities. So disproportionately liberal, Democratic voters, who now have been moved to Republican districts, right? And so it beefs up the Republican rural vote. And there are stories across the country of these state senators who, without their prison, won't have their seat. Um, And in fact, when New York State changed their law, they changed it in this very, very narrow window when the Democrats controlled both chambers and the governor's mansion. And even despite that, the Republicans managed to push through something that split an, an upstate Senate seat in half, right, district in half, right? Basically on the grounds they knew they're going to lose at least one seat when the prisoners got shifted back to New York City and Buffalo. And so they, they took some rural area that was all Republican and tried to cut it in half to, um, 
to bolster that that loss seat. If I'm not mistaken, I think that seat is now held by a Democrat, which is kind of funny. Um, but it's, it's, it's incredibly boring, right? Census enumeration, yet it leads state reps across the country to really powerfully fight reform because if, they, if reforms happen and prisons shrink, they'll lose their seats. And the parties will lose their seats, right? I named the states because it's not a random sample, right? California, Delaware, Maryland, and New York, four of the bluest states in the country. And that's not surprising because there's a strong political valence here. Uh, and the fact that right now, what, the Republicans have the trifecta of both chambers and the governor's mansion in something like 20 some Six states, states, 26 I think. states now, right? I, this census reform is not going to happen at the local level anytime soon unless the Census Bureau itself changes the rules, which they are debating doing right now. Um, so, so that's an example of the kind of nitty-gritty, yeah. dry-as-dirt stuff that we're going to have to address. If, right. Exactly. Yeah. If this matters, it's boring. It's not, it's not what we want to hear. But the shocking stuff that, that, that hasn't been hammered out is probably still a problem because it's not that important. And if it's still a problem and we haven't fixed it, it's probably because it's like, you want to talk about the sense? I don't want to talk about the sense. I want to talk about like something really shocking. If you, no one, you go to a party and you talk about, I represent someone on death row, everyone circles you wants to hear about your death penalty case, right? You're like, oh yeah, no, I was down the census fighting enumeration. Like, I guarantee you, you're drinking alone in that party, right? But you're actually doing far more good for the overall system than the, the person's got that one shocking case. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.